Thank you, everybody, for showing up today. My name is Alexander Van Manju, and it is my pleasure to moderate the kickoff event for the fourth annual Modern Money Network Conference. Our panel today collects a host of fellow travelers that is on MMT content production and publication. Uh, the format of the panel will be some brief intro rows, two or three minutes from everyone, um, an hour of moderated discussion. And in the meantime, we'll be collecting your, any questions you ask in the chat, and then we'll put them back to the panelists at the end of the Q&A and um, try to have everyone interact as much as possible. For the panelists, I'll ask that um, I will invite you to jump into conversation. I will only kind of step in as a moderator um, if people are like talking, you know, screaming over each other. But I'll be there to generally guide the discussion, but don't feel you need to be prompted to speak up first. Anyways, enough of me. I'm not the one you came to see here today. Um, I would like the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Christian and Patricia. Okay. Uh, my name's Christian Riley. I'm the co-host of the MMT podcast. We're based in London. Uh, we started a few years ago. We love it. We're just here to uh, just uh, get the MMT paradigm out there. We won't quit until it becomes the prevailing paradigm um and uh, uh but thanks to everybody who who's on this panel for doing what you do uh i'm a, an addict to mmt content so i really appreciate being brought together by the organizers of uh the conference uh and some of the people here i haven't met and uh, uh it online or elsewhere so um it, this is really great for me, uh, but it's not about me. I'm going to shut up and um, hand it over to Patricia. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Patricia, and I've been an engineer for 15 years, but I've also recently completed a master's in economics and finance. Uh, about seven years ago, I came across a theory called Modern Monetary Theory from a blog by an economist called Bill Mitchell, uh, and that sparked my interest in economics and sort of changed the course of my professional life. Um, so ever since I've been absorbing as much information as I could about it and involved myself with the activist MMT community in the UK. Uh, my most significant contribution so far has been alongside Christian doing the uh, MMT podcast, uh, an opportunity for which I'm very, very grateful. And I'm also grateful for being invited here to speak to today about my experience on that. Hello, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, I'm Jeff Epstein. I host a podcast called Activist MMT. I now describe it as a podcast about real world economics, including modern money theory and how life changes when you discover it. So it's half about academic concepts, half about personal stories of MMTers, both academics and average people. Um, I have a current, I have about 130 episodes right now, including multi-episode series about many varied things like monetary reform, the UK exchequer paper, and most recently, Polanyi's Great Transformation and student debt horror stories. I also co-host and produce an interview series of MMT Aware Candidates with Ramona Masachi, and we've actually interviewed every panelist who's going to be on the April 23rd conference panel, uh, MMT and Running for Office. Uh, I've guest hosted and produced 15 episodes for Isha Krishnaswamy's Historically, and I also produce the audio podcast for Stephen Hale and Gabby Bond's Modern Money Donuts for Kerberos Media. Um, outside of audio, I have a large and growing collection of Learn MMT resources, which you can find at activistmmt.org. It's written for average people, but guides them to the works of the academics. Um, for the past year, I've studied economic history under the guidance of PhD economist Asad Zaman. Uh, Professor Zaman recently discovered MMT and other real world economics and real history after more than three decades as a mainstream economist and econometrician. Um, and finally, I'm very excited to have been accepted on full scholarship to the week-long uh, June 2022 Levy Economics Institute summer session. Um, I will likely always be the small kid on the MMT podcast block, but my real motivation for doing this is because I have to. It's become my way of giving myself as much as it's possible, the formal education I wish I could have, but at least until Torrens University and Modern Money Layup came along, um, I thought I never would have. So I can only hope that others get some benefit out of my journey. Um, thank you to Hannah and Modern Money Network for inviting me to participate on today's panel. Uh, I've learned a lot over these past four years from everybody on this panel. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Jeff. I'll pass over to Jessica next. Hey y'all, Jessica. I am someone who grew up just outside of New York City, grew up during the financial crisis. My first like radicalizing moment was definitely when we saw, you know, the bankers on Wall Street get bailed out with with billions of dollars of public funds. And my dad was a carpenter. He was one of the people who like worked on houses and built houses. And while they got bailed out, we were struggling to keep our own. And that was my first sense of, you know, the system's rigged against us. And really wanted to figure out why that was, um, but didn't for a long time. Ended up, you know, going to grad school thinking the answers would be there and they weren't. And then I worked for the Bernie campaign where I first became exposed to Stephanie Kelton's work as Bernie's former economic advisor and really looked into what she was doing uh, because I was writing a TED talk on how to restructure the U.S. economy, like just painting the picture for, for what's going wrong now and what a new direction would be. And didn't fully understand everything Stephanie was saying, but my curiosity was piqued and I made sure I didn't say anything that contradicted MMT. But I looked into it more and then the campaign ended and I had way more time to read. I read The Deficit Myth. And then we couldn't organize in person anymore. So I went on to TikTok and decided to start corrupting the youth and spreading MMT among the youth. And that was really fun. And now I still do TikTok and also make content for the Young Turks, like bringing MMT content into like presenting the news. So if Tucker Carlson's talking about inflation, I'm talking about the MMT approach to an inflation in response to that. Um, so yeah, that's what I do now, and I'll pass it back to you, Alexander. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll pass it over to the Money on the Left crew. So uh, Max, Natty, Will, feel free to introduce yourselves. I suppose we'll go in that order. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to see some of you again and uh, meet others. Um, yeah, so I'm Max, one of the uh, superstructure hosts that are here. Uh, doing my PhD in comparative literature uh, at UC Santa Barbara, um, one of the humanities scholars, I suppose, in the MMT space. And um, yeah, I've been going to these conferences basically since uh, the first MMT conference in 20, is that 2017, I think. Um, and, you know, working, working and podcasting and thinking about different ways to communicate and investigate some of the insights that MMT has to offer and yeah, you know, happy to be here and I'll, I'll pass it off to Natty. I'm Natty. This is uh, my first conference, but I got in with these guys doing podcasting with superstructure and then later medium femme. And so it's been a fun journey. I'm, I'm down in Santiago, Chile. I've been here a long time, but I like to be in touch with like the different media intellectual currents going on. And I think economics in the last few years has kind of like reasserted itself in interesting ways. And it's always doing that right. And I think sort of performing the ongoingness of this feminist pedagogy of um, learning on your way and learning together. And that's like part of this performative register of trying to talk to people. And yeah, I'm doing, um, medium fam to this other show. So it's nice to meet all you guys and be here and be on this journey talking media and economics and politics with everybody. Hey, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Will Beeman. Um, I'm another co-host of the Superstructure podcast. Uh, and I also, um, with uh, the Money on the Left uh, collective, um, I uh, am the editor for the Superstructure Vertical, which is an online publishing platform. Um, and just to say something about money on the left, uh, we come from a, a, a very mixed background. I mean, we're an international collaboration of variously researchers and misfits and, you know, a, <laughs> a lot of a uh, lot, lot of different folks. Um, but I think we come especially from a humanities and uh, media studies tradition. And you often hear about money, that money is a medium of exchange. Uh, and you hear that, of course, from neoclassical economists who then kind of want to stop the story there. Um, and MMT says, no, no, it's actually really important that money is a medium because the medium is the message, right? And uh, the medium, it turns out, is actually quite important. And so for our, for our media studies ears, 
uh, this made intuitive, perfect sense to us. Um, and the other thing that I want to say about, uh, about the media studies position that we come from is that in media studies, there's often a claim to a, a view from outside of power and a lot of skepticism towards power, um, condemning it and imagining what, what we're building as fully outside of power. And we still have that in our bones a little bit, um, so to speak. We don't simply want to shore up power and we take very seriously that money has been used uh, towards positive ends and towards very uh, negative ends. Um, but we come from a different uh, perspective than I think uh, some other folks uh, in in media studies and across the humanities come from uh, with regard to this question where I, I don't like to think of uh, of anybody as being outside just because they're not fully inside. Um, I sort of think of us as the eccentric middle <laughs> and it's and it's an eccentric middle that that everybody uh, belongs to. Um, and of course we're an experimental podcast superstructure, but we kind of combine that with uh, attention to uh, mass culture and mass media. And if you've ever heard one of our episodes on uh, on Marvel films, for instance, or the new Hollywood blockbuster, you can see that for us, uh, the middle and the common is actually eccentric and, and anything but basic. Uh, so thank you all for, uh, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. All right. Thank you very much, each of you. And last but not least, Steve, finish us off with the intros, please. Hey, thanks for having me on. Um, my name's Steve Grumbine. Uh, I came to MMT back in, I guess, the 2008-2009 time frame, uh, just as I lost a 17-year career at Verizon. Um, I had just got my MBA, a Master of Science in Technology Management, and really didn't understand exactly how bad the world was around me. Uh, I felt like it was kind of a weird, I just won, I got these two graduate degrees, and yet I'm about to lose my home, I'm losing my family, and everything was going to hell in a handbasket. Um, and so some people that knew that I was reasonably intelligent uh, from the Grumbine's political mosh pit days, early Facebook groups, uh, came to me and taught me about MMT. A guy named Bruce Patrick introduced me to people like uh, Warren Mosler and others, and it just sort of took off. And... Um, you know, over the course of time, um, I created a group called Real Progressives that later became a 501c3, Real Progressives, Inc. And we also created a 501c4 called Real Progress in Action. Um, I am the host of a podcast uh, called Macro and Cheese. Um, we've almost got uh, 170 episodes, um, deals with history, deals with um, different authors' journeys and socio-political, socio-economic uh, kind of uh, uh, topics that we cover. I also host three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my own show called uh, The Rogue Scholar. It's at noon. Um, but I'm also now a co-host on Status Coup with Jordan Cheriton, formerly a TYT. And I do my own Let's Get Ready to Grumble on Thursday nights, uh, which is a produced show over there as well. Um, I wish some of the other people from Real Progressives could be here because we've got a lot of other people. It makes it look like I'm just by myself. And believe me, I have an entire team of people that work tirelessly uh, to help me out. So I feel kind of weird being up here by myself when they're out there. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for having me on here and uh, look forward to it. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Steve. Um, so uh, the first kind of question that I wanted to get at, and um, some of you partially touched on it in your introductions, but what is the, what is the audience you aim for with, with, you, with each of your content? Um, uh, how does sort of like MMT center in it, and are there any challenges in terms of fronting 101 stuff for people that are relatively new to the field versus having uh, more novel stuff for the people who have been around the block for a while? Um, Anyone who wants to take that, uh, go for it. I think I think Christian would be quite good at answering this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for nominating. Sorry, me there. it's a really big of you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
I don't actually know who the audience is. I kind <laughs> of go, um, if just as just for our stuff, I kind of just go with what I would want to hear. <laughs> uh, I just remember being, um, uh, uh, Steve just reminded me, I think a lot of us were in this position after 2008, just, you know, what the hell's going on? We were hearing this story about money's run out <laughs> and uh, everybody brace yourself because the government's run out of money. And then the, alongside headlines of uh, actually we're spending trillions propping up the banking system. And it's like, okay, well, how can these two things be true at the same time? And you start reading around that kind of stuff ultimately you get to the question of okay god what is money where does it come from and you can end up going down a lot of rabbit holes you've all seen them you know a lot of people like to shroud it all in mystery and then if you're lucky you come across a clip of you know warren mosler or kelton or or, or bill mitchell just like going okay it's a tax credit that's the end of it right okay well what are the implications of that and i just find all that really fascinating and so I just kind of put myself in the position of somebody because uh, uh, I kind of still am there. I'm not very far from there that uh, who's perplexed by all this stuff that we're swimming around in, all this commentary that we're swimming around in, what and maybe what I would like to hear. Uh, so, yeah, it's very, uh, I don't know what the word is, solipsistic, <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, but um, uh, and, and that's what I go by, I, I think. I, I think what we've... I think when it, when I'm making something or, or when anybody's making something, it's good to kind of go, what's the point of this? What's it for? And like I say, our mission, I think we've we've not written it down anywhere, but I think it's implicit is we just keep going until it's normal for people to think about money in the MMT way, not the household analogy way, which is what's normal now. And so we're going to keep going with that. And, and so then I get to go, OK, did this listening back to it when i'm editing okay does, is this does this get as nearer or further away from that goal so there's a way to decide whether you it, it's a compass you know and uh so that so that's it it's just out there for whoever finds that useful and, and i think that that's kind of all, all all you can go by really because i think if you just go you, you can if you want to judge yeah, uh, whether a content's been successful or not by how many hits it's got. And if you do that and then adjust on that basis of the basis of trying to make that number go up, eventually you you know, you're gonna end up running an adult film site. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think you need to have this uh, that that compass point and and which you can add to that if you know what to do and then just to ramble on a bit longer <laughs> um at the i think the shortage that we have at the moment the the real scarcity it's not money it's attention so and i think the only way you can build attention you know in a way that doesn't just turn your website into a sort of eyeball magnet <laughs> is 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 through trust you know do and, and so i think is this thing we're about to put out there likely to build trust or not so yeah i would put those two coordinates in and then i think yeah i, I um mo 99 of the time on our podcast i put a, an intro on there because i think some people are going to come to this just they're going to randomly click on our thing and they're going to start hearing something and i think what happens in those first 15 20 30 seconds dictates whether they follow through and just go uh, and listen to something else so i try and make the very first thing that happens catchy uh and then and then it goes into a bit where i'm speaking and generally as if you're pretty uninformed or you, you know curious but maybe you've not heard a lot of this language before maybe you don't know what aggregate demand is maybe you don't know you know and, and so just talk people through that so that to maybe let that new person know look you're in the right place we'll, we won't try and alienate you we want you to listen to this whole thing and you know and, and i think for the people that maybe know are very savvy you know uh, the great thing about podcasts is there's this uh skip 30 seconds 30 seconds this <laughs> you just skip to the the meat of the interview if you just want to hear warren or or, or uh 
you know Stephen Hale or, or Robert Hockett or whoever you've tuned in for. So that anyway, I think hopefully that's answered the question. Oh, totally. Uh, sometimes you never know with podcasts whether it's one of those series where you're supposed to go to the first one and like play it sequentially, or if it's one of those mm. ones. God forbid you ever do that. It's like um, you know they're just the, the, the worst mic in existence. You can barely hear what they're saying. They don't know what they're saying, and so on. Um, I, so, I often, sorry to just jump in. I'm sorry. Go for it. Um, I, I often put if there's something in there where somebody said something and it needs further explanation, and we've done a whole episode about it in the introduction. I might say, okay, our episode blah 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 is about that particular topic. So I'm just trying to. I don't know. It's it's kind. Of, I don't know if it's the right thing or the wrong thing, but I'm just trying to link it people up to the most information. The mo you know the the right journey. Uh, for them if they're confused about something anyway uh, i'll buy out no I, I think it was really important for us from the beginning that um the podcast was accessible to lay people and that that was our priority uh, sometimes you know we try different things and some things resonate and some things don't resonate and sometimes it's predictable sometimes it's not and you know i think the more we use the podcast as a means to ourselves absorb information the more we find common ground with the audience who is also trying to understand these concepts for the first time totally um so i'll i'll, I'll start calling people out um so jessica how do the dynamics of that content creation sort of differ um on a platform like tiktok yeah this is definitely related to the question you just posed of like who is your your audience and i think realizing that most people that would see whatever i create it would be coming up on an endless feed of videos and all it takes is like a thumb swipe and they're at the next video so you really have to like capture their attention within the first few seconds like maybe even milliseconds of the video coming on their screen and yeah you have to you know, talk about MMT in a way that doesn't use terms that are unfamiliar. They're not, you know, terms you wouldn't use in your, your everyday life. And that's really challenging because this is complex stuff and you lose a certain degree of nuance by boiling the language down. So it's hard to be precise, but also use language that people use in their everyday lives to reach them. And so the audience on TikTok is probably, you know, different from like the Young Turks because everyone on TikTok is just everyday people looking for entertainment. And so then you run into this thing of, of, am I bringing them entertainment and information at the same time? And, and what's the compromise there? Because sometimes people will watch one of the videos and say, well, surely she's being sarcastic. We can't just create new dollars that won't solve our problems. And I think some of that's good agitational work for them to think, oh, is this sarcasm? But it kind of logically does make sense. I think that's, that's still a net positive impact. And just making that consideration before posting a video, like sometimes I'll show it to my parents who like never went to college, you know, they, they pay attention to the news, but they're not really entrenched in this stuff uh, and in theory. And so like running it by them and having them ask questions, I think has been super helpful. Just like understanding that most people don't even care that deeply about what's going on in the public sphere. And you're also selling them caring about it. Like, why should why should they care about it? Why is this relevant for their everyday lives? So not only does it have to be like accessible information, it's got to be interesting and entertaining and it's got to be relevant to them. And that's really tricky. Um, and it doesn't always go well. And there have been a lot of learnings. But I think like the, the main learning is, is that people can care about this stuff. Like I never would have dreamed that as many people would be following me on TikTok for the content that I post or that like 300,000 people would watch a video about Nairu. Uh, and so it's really cool. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I'll go to Will next and then Jeff afterwards. Sure, thanks. Um, so in terms of our audiences, uh, we of course want people who consider themselves to be activists who are already mobilized and already you know ready for action um and in the superstructure podcast we we really pay close attention to uh a lot of the online discourses around activism uh you know in the american context you know stuff with dsa but also just kind of um you know or organizing left twitter and you know related discourses and things like that because we take the view that um you know media is important and constitutive of on the ground in important ways 
Um, but there's also a scholarly capacity building element to the collective that, that I think comes through more in the Money on the Left podcast, uh, as well as the superstructure vertical, the publishing platform, uh, which is um, the, the podcast anyway, is less editorial than superstructure, more ecumenical. Um, it still has an editorial voice, but I think it's an editorial voice that, that kind of leads from the rear rather than from the front um, in kind of a more gentle framing way. Um, but I will say that the listeners that I'm most uh, proud of uh, you know, connecting with um, connect to us in uh, their own um, very particular uh, kind of niche sort of ways. And I don't mean particular and niche necessarily like they're like us and they say reify a lot. See, I'm watching the chat. Um, I don't mean I don't mean it quite like that. Um, and, and maybe Natty can speak to this with medium femme, uh, but because our project is so interested in drawing analogies across uh, different fields, we find a lot of people who connect with uh, and have strong feelings about whatever their specific craft is. Um, and they see what they do as infrastructure and they, um, you know, and they they're very proud of what they do. Um, and they connect to questions of money and social accounting and infrastructure because they see that that's what gives what they do dignity and also, you know, can kind of control the, the horizons of, you know, how they can do what they do even more. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll hand it to Jeff and then Natty afterwards. Um, yeah. So I mean, the title of my podcast, I, you know, has activists and I kind of think of that in two senses. Um, number one, it's our term for a lay people. It's a, our term for a lay person, but it also implies taking the theory and applying it, you know, for people who are more politically oriented. So I, I like to, I like to learn in public. I consider my podcast as kind of learning in public and I'm, I'm very open about that learning. I'm, I'm, you know, especially in my written work, I'm extremely, uh, I have a very bold disclaimer of, you know, I know a good amount, but I'm, I'm not an academic. I don't speak for the project. Here's how you can get in touch with me to, to tell me how to do better. Um, so, I mean, who's my audience is basically people like me. Uh, like, you know, I, I know a decent amount after four years now, but it's very important to me. And I think important to the project that we always keep in mind of how to communicate you know, these very subtle, comp sometimes complicated concepts that we're learning and being able to translate that to, to those who know nothing or or have been marinated in, in nonsense for, you know, their whole lives. Um, uh, and, I, and I also think that it's important for those who do know a lot to learn from those who are learning from them to, you know, that we, we, you know, we learn from the academics. And I think it is an important element. I think there is an important thing of the academics or, you know, people who know a lot to keep in touch with those who are learning and struggling to learn and say it in the right way. And I, I think that's valuable as well. So. Go ahead. Yeah, I, Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think it's uh, there's a lot of different types of conversations, and I think it's really important that we be accessible to in a register of left political things. I mean, like tech, the political stakes are the emotional technicality for people. Right. And I think we need to be thoughtful about creating space for creativity. And I think there's just all different kinds of paths that we can in an abolitionist practice be doing so we can be looking at technicalities of a certain thing, maybe using types of, you know, conversations that are less familiar to people. I mean, that's how translation, that's how different languages, different trade works, right? We're dealing with dialogues where people have different familiarities, different areas of comfort, different elements of finance and the ethical stakes of that care, that media, that finance is about, about world building, basically. And so I think it's valuable to have this very creative approach that's open and kind of generous to cultivating different registers of thoughtfulness about these political stakes, which I think that's why I appreciate everybody's projects. And I think it's important that people are feeling like they can engage and that there's different types of engagement.
because the political stakes are for everybody and the creativity is part of the political stake and there can be different paths. Absolutely, thanks for that. Uh, I'll hand it to Max and then Steve. Yeah, just real quick, I just wanna add, I think um, something that being familiar, I think with everyone's work here uh, on this panel and and how how valuable it is in in the different in the differences and the different approaches that everyone takes. Just to say that um, the sort of different audiences that we're cultivating, um, you know, there is a lot of overlap, of course, because there's also an MMT community, right? Um, but I I think those different approaches, in, in some sense, the complementarity of of those different approaches is necessary if we're going to be affecting and uh, a certain kind of change and reaching uh, people from very diverse, um, you know, places and from with diverse ideological priors and you know, in speaking different languages and you know we could go on and so I think that's one of the things that. Um, especially more recently too we've been trying to prioritize just thinking about the way all this all these sort of complementary modes of media practice can can like hang loose uh amongst each other and and we also have these moments to to bring them together and, and have conversations so just seconding a lot of what people have said but figured i'd add that Thanks a lot. Uh, now, Steve, you're awfully quiet in the corner there. What, what are some of the lessons you've learned over your, uh, you know, years of the many things you listed in the intro about cultivating audience, et cetera? Well, I think one of the most important things that um, I, I just wanted to bring to the table is that when I got involved in this, I, I didn't get involved in it um, because I wanted to make media. I, I got involved in it because I had extreme PTSD from the global financial crisis that occurred and um i lost a family over it and uh i i i have nightmares still crawling on the floor as i hear the door being knocked on and process servers coming and police officers coming and driving a car without reverse and having to coast into parking spaces and grass six feet high because i couldn't afford to cut my own grass and uh just I, this stuff really burned a hole in my soul. And, um, and I've often talked about it and I'm very open about it. I come from a recovery background. I have a former Republican. Um, I come from a, uh, a background where life is real, where teeth are rotting, where uh, people's precarity is real. Okay. It's not an academic thing for me at all. Although I do have the credit, you know, I was, well into a PhD program when my divorce went through. So um, it's not like I don't have the creds there. The issue for me is, is that this didn't matter to me until I realized that it was the answer to a lot of the problems that I went through. So the people that I try to talk to, um, you know, they're, they're, they're people that are hurting. They're not people that are gonna be offended necessarily. They're people that are really hurting like I did. Um, they're people that are probably going to lose their home. They're people that are um, wondering why any of this matters. And so for me, my rage, my um, my passion, things like that, they're not drummed up in any shape or form. They're they're like, I lived it. That's my, that's the life. And um, MMT shined a light on a possibility that was different than what I went through. And as a father, I think to myself, how irresponsible of me to not take this message out there. So I find a lot of the people that really hearken to my message are people that hear the passion, hear the explosion, hear the energy, um, and, and that aren't just trying to learn an academic thingy, like a, a accounting thingy. And that's a lot of what I used to get as pushback is, why are you focusing on this accounting thingy? When you're sitting there talking about suicide, I don't get it. Why would they two go together? And so a lot of my work, um, you know, in the podcast, I'm I'm far less strident. I'm far more in my academic mind, far more in a, a conversational tone. I, I ferret out a lot of thoughts, a lot of theory, a lot of considerations that I've learned along the way from different schools, from different people. Um, so I think I have a different audience in the macro and cheese world, although my music in there definitely speaks to my inner person, right? 
but um I, I, that is definitely a different angle and then when i'm on status quo or when i'm doing the rogue scholar or when i'm on a different show i you know i bring different elements of my person out depending on the audience um and so i think it's really important to realize that the people that are hurting out there a lot of those people they they want to hear someone that understands that pain they don't want to be gentled they don't want to be coaxed into some false you know dulcimer type thing they want to they want you they want to know that that you know what they're talking about they want to know that you know that pain and i do it's real it's not a i don't have to be contrived about it at all and so uh i think i think it's a multitude of angles i think that um Overall, the art organization is filled with a lot of broken toys. And um, I think that we, we try to address the broken toys. I'm, I think there's plenty of people out there that are able to deal with the people that have a 401k and nice stock portfolio and stuff like that. I'm the guy that's talking to the other people. That's the way I view it. That's, that's my audience. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know whether it works or not, but I've been around for a while and um, I feel like I'm adding value. And the minute that I don't feel like I'm adding value, I'll stop doing it because there's enough podcasters in the world. One one less isn't going to hurt anyone's feelings. You're all adding enough value to be on this panel. And for tonight, that's what matters. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'll hand it over to Patricia and then Natty afterwards. Um, I just, I guess I sort of had a, a question. I don't know if you um, asked me not to hijack the whole thing, but um you know, I, 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 I had a question because I hear um, we all have different approaches and the but we're all really driven by the same kind of desire to do a make a positive change. And I think that our different experiences and perhaps our different locations as well drives us to select different strategies for how to best to achieve that. And um, in in. In our case, and perhaps I'll, I'll speak just personally because Christian may have a different perspective, but um, sometimes we get messages from the audience uh, saying that uh, you shouldn't be so, you know, obviously a lefty and you shouldn't be pushing so hard for progressive causes because that puts off a lot of people on the right who actually want to learn about MMT but don't want to be lectured constantly about these things. And, and our approach to that, to that response has been, you know, if, if you are right wing economically and, and, and want to learn about MMT, by all means, um, join us and learn more from us. But we don't want to be dishonest with the audience and hide the fact that, you know, we are driven by certain um, objectives. And um, so that's been our approach, I think. I don't want to speak for Christian, but I pretty sure it has been so I just wanted to ask everybody and I think Steve has already given uh, quite a bit hint as to what his position on that might be but um, have you encountered that from the audience and, and how what, what's your approach to that do you just simply dismiss this group of people or, or, or do you also try to engage with them thank you uh, that you're not going to believe me but something similar to that was going to be one of my next questions um, sort of like where's there room for collaboration sort of piggybacking off of that uh, with folks that are not MMT and, and, and where is they're not. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Natty, she had her hand raised, and then Christian, and then anyone can um, jump in afterwards as they wish. Yeah, I just wanted to say that sort of the academic or the media as like categories and meme are not outside of precarity and pain, right? And I think we want to be really careful about thinking about having an absolute idea of who is and isn't our audience. I think that performance is a part of reality. And I think there's a really strong tradition in black studies and queer studies and feminist practice that performance is part of seriousness about reality and media and um, abstraction and art and um, academia are places of pain and precarity that want to share in the solution. And so I think that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Christian. Uh, I was just going to chime in and say I completely disagree with everything Patricia just said. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, no, um, the, yeah, no, I completely agree with it. And it ties back to um, what I was saying about building trust. 
um this might be a uk thing because of the bbc <laughs> but uh, you know those of us that have been paying attention for a fair bit of time who are into indie media understand that when an organization says we are the unvarnished unbiased center <laughs> we are the truth uh you should run a million miles from that you know it's that that it's the how it's in thing you can't be neutral on a moving train so anybody pretending to be unbiased is pretending <laughs> so i think a way to build trust is to say these are our values you know be very explicit about it so we don't start out at every single episode with like okay this is our manifesto and this is what but we just make sure that we do not lean away from like what our what our politics are because um you know the, in fact um andres uh, who's our most recent episode said a uh, you know a similar thing you know how can you be in the world how can you be conscious <laughs> and, you know we're not zombies we're not robots how can you be conscious and not have some kind of ideology so and i also think that um then people who don't have your ideological bias it shouldn't be too painful them for them to listen to because it's like okay I, i'm not you know now you can adjust for for my bias you know i you know i'm not going to insult you by saying i'm right because i'm completely unbiased um which i find the the thing that really turns me off and it's why i, I can't consume a lot of what was supposedly left left media or nominally left media because it's neoliberal uh, uh as flip <laughs> uh which I'll, I'll put it like that in uh now we're before the watershed <laughs> okay all right i'll go away now thank you very much um i'll hand it over to will and then jeff afterwards Sure. Um, thanks. So I wanted to say uh, I really appreciate what uh, Steve shared, and I wanted to echo it uh, sort of in my own way and say that um, MMT has been like a really therapeutic uh, way of thinking for me, too. Um, and I think that what private money and, you know, the how are you going to pay for it and all of these questions do is they make everybody, they make what everybody is going through uh, feel to them and to potentially to everybody else, like it's some isolated thing, like they're dead weight on society. Um, like they don't have space unless, uh, you know, unless some benevolent taxpayer, right, is, is going to give them space. Um, and, you know, whether, whether it's literally the kind of, you know, history of taxpayer being racially coded language or all of the kinds of you know, other ways and just kind of interpersonal human relationships where, you know, you um, in in relating to people often like a, a premise of of interpersonal abuse and interpersonal violence is is the same sort of fallacies that that are this person is the sinner who takes up space and this person is the one who's holding up both of them. And, you know, I think that what what MMT gets at and why it resonates so much with with people in such a deep emotional way and, and i'm astounded at the number of ways that it resonates with people is because it kind of starts with an assumption that like wherever you are right where you are is is not taking up space is not pushing somebody else off the platform is not you know what, whatever your kind of metaphor is um and yeah, and I, I just I want to I want to just make like a meta kind of reflective comment just about how how much I love the the kind of all the different approaches echoing what what uh, Patricia was saying that that are on display here um, because I think that that we are all really complementary of each other um, and and I am really looking forward to talking about uh, you know collaborations and this kind of thing. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand it over to Jeff and then Jessica after him. Um, I, I was, uh, there was a great question in the chat by Virginia Cotts um, that I assumed was going to be, you know, later in the question and answer, sort of the audience section, but it's starting to come up quite a lot. Uh, Christian just said, um, uh, I'll say Virginia's question. Uh, so Virginia's question was, some say MMT is or should be apolitical. Do you agree? Do you include ideology with MMT content? And Christian just said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. 
And a long time ago, well, okay, so you can't be neutral on a moving train, which I'll be honest, and I don't totally understand that analogy, but I get the gist of it. And and a long time ago, I heard Christians say that there's nothing wrong with bias in journalism. What there's What is wrong is undisclosed bias in journalism. That's the problem. And the reason is, and actually, as, as Andre Spernal just said on, on MMT podcast, which I've heard several times on Money on the Left, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's impossible to describe an inherently political system without that description also being inherently political. It has to be political because it's about a political system. And even more deeply than that, there's no such thing as apolitical. Not being political is nothing more than the politics of those already on top. And... Uh, there's also a concept I just learned from Michel Foucault, who, which is called power knowledge, which is that you can't, you cannot separate knowledge or information from the power of the person who, of the power of the, of those who deliver it. You can't separate those two. So whatever information you hear is always in the context of who told it to you and what their motivations are and so on. Um, and actually just as a final comment, I, I don't remember exactly how he phrases this, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but I have heard Bill, or at least seen Bill Mitchell write that MMT is in fact apolitical or, or just a description or however he phrases it. Um, and I'm, so I'm actually very interested in, in hearing his response to everything that I just said to that concept, so. Hey, thanks a lot, Jeff. I'll hand it over to Jessica. Yeah, also thinking a lot about uh, ideology and politicizing our work around MMT. I think it's an interesting question. I mean, we talked all the time on the Bernie campaign, are we losing people by explicitly saying the word socialism? Um, and I think it's tough because I think we do win people on the issues. And I think people came on board with the Bernie campaign because they heard us talking about the struggles in their lives and what the solutions to those were, regardless of what, what party they belong to. There are people on both sides who really clung to that vision that Bernie had and so even though we we win people on the issues, I think having something to bring people into is good and understanding that this is larger than just this one analysis on this one issue, I think is good. Like I remember when I first really became radicalized and realized that that, hey, like we're experiencing an illusion of scarcity, not actual scarcity. What are the people who are criticizing this saying that they're a part of? And hearing that they were calling themselves, you know, socialists uh, was useful for me to find more information. And I think as MMTers, like the question of collaboration, like having a place where everyone who's interested in this can go and see like all of our content, like everyone on the panel and people in the chat, I think would, would be good. But uh, like on TikTok, I think about like, do I want to start this video with talking about like mainstream progressive policies and then go into the MMT stuff? Like, I really don't want to lose people before they hear me out. And so that's something I think about a lot. Um, and the workaround is, is to humanize yourself. I think we want people to be able to make decisions with the evidence in their everyday lives and be able to see themselves in you and your work. And I don't think making content without that element, like people follow people, people want to hear why it's outrageous and interesting to you and relevant to your life so they can see themselves in you and see how it's relevant to their lives as well. Um, and so I think like our workaround for still being explicitly a part of, you know, an ideological faction is to present that narrative, hopefully first, but in tandem so that people like, I really like what Christian said about building trust. Uh, so that's what comes to mind. Thanks a lot, Jessica. I'll uh, throw it over to Max now. Yeah, I, I really like all of that, especially um, the point about humanizing yourself. Um, I think the way I approach particularly some of, perhaps some of the more, I guess you could call it esoteric, and I don't mean that in a bad way, um, aspects of, of thinking with, around, all over uh, MMT, and in different directions in a very explicitly political way to the to Christian's point, right, about um, the inherent politics of all of this is in a sense to trust that um, audiences will follow and find you where you are and they will participate and 
tap into what you're offering in the way that they do. And that's a choice that is very much informed by where they're coming from, which you don't fully get to decide, right? So there is a, there's a bit of trust, a bit of, I guess, letting what you're making, right? Could it be what it is for other people and how they want to make meaning out of it that I think it's, for me, it's been an important way of, of thinking about how we can reach people with MMT where they need, like in the ways that they need, right? Um, and not not trying absolutely to pick that for them, but also at the same time, making sure to to give them, you know, particular paths that that they can sort of go down and work towards on 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 their own time and in their own um, in their own ways that that are unique to them. So um, I'm not necessarily sure how much is that that is you know adding to fully this whole conversation, except to say that. Um, I think it's important to to start from that very open place and let, because MMT is about, you know, making fiscal space for including everyone with rights-based uh, politics and, and full employment and, 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 you know, caretaking policy, starting from that perspective at the level of what we make and, and allowing people to be reached where they are, and also knowing that you as any individual are limited in who you can reach and and letting that be okay and then hence the need for collectivities like this one to reach different people with different skill sets and different experiences so i'll uh, i'll pass it on not not meander on more thanks a lot max uh steve you were the one that sort of like brought us towards this topic but uh haven't spoken on this question directly do you have anything you would like to share from your experiences on this you know i I think that, uh, you know, people on the right are genuinely um, interested in fairness. You know, they're inherently interested in fairness. And um, when they see somebody getting something for free, um, they naturally assume that it's coming from them because they made sacrifices. And uh, whatever those sacrifices are, they made sacrifices. And um, so MMT helps kind of take away the villain um you know from those individuals and i know for me um you know i i when i first came to mmt i had uh been a ron paul guy just to put it in perspective i had been campaigning for ron paul and um you know and the fed all the other stuff and uh you know when i was hearing about it it, it literally when i realized the difference between a currency user and a currency issuer. And I understood the difference between states and the Fed, federal government, and, and just sort of some of these very, very black and white structural things that are the way they are. Um, it, it fundamentally took away the sting and the, the anger that I had, you know, because it, it was just, it's just part of that right wing reactionary feeling of, uh, you know, how, how do you how do you get past this? So from a perspective of an audience, I like what Will said. You really don't have a choice in kind of who picks up on you. They get to make that choice, right? They get to choose how they interact with you. They get to choose what they take from you and whether they like what you do or not. Um, but I do know from my perspective as a guy who came from the right now would say I'm much further to the left than I ever imagined of my in my uh, 53 years, I just can't, my father would roll over, I'm sure. The bust of Reagan and stuff would just blow up. Um, but just knowing that though, and understanding the talking points and understanding the um, the logic, if you will. And there is a logic, there is a logic to it. It's just a logic founded in scarcity. It's a logic founded in, in finding scapegoats for why things are the way they are. And, and wanting to be a problem solver, you know, in their own weird way. Um, and w when you do understand this MMT concept, the most fundamental parts of it, not, not getting into the deep theoretical currents, but just at the most basic, you know, Randy Ray, MMT primer, you know, type stuff, 
the seven deadly innocent fraud type stuff. The, these are things that we cut our teeth on. We didn't have memes. We didn't have great videos. There was no real podcast. There was no nothing. It, you just, you slugged it out and you listened to grainy videos with bad audio and, and you just sort of sucked it up and did it. You know, you just did what you had to do to learn it because you realized, oh my God, there's something here. So I think that from a standpoint of touching audiences, you know, I, I know for a fact that I, my inbox fills up with a lot of people that tap into that, that recognize certain things. And, um, and I don't, I don't pretend to be all things to all people. I, I, I recognize the need for that collective. There's gotta be different people being the whisperer for the different groups there's so many groups out there that have different grievances and different real life experiences that maybe they don't they don't they won't connect with me or you or someone else and and that's okay there's got to be a way of growing that space and growing those voices and and presenting different perspectives uh on how to do it now one of the toughest things is is that when you are someone like myself who has lived that world and who understands that world and comes from a a specific place and has made that cross country journey, so to speak to the left. Um, you know, I feel like I understand myself pretty well. And, um, and it's tough because people don't always afford you the understanding of, of what you've been through. They don't often, t they, they, they take their own biases and their own concerns and their own thoughts and they fling it back at you, whatever they feel. They don't take the time to necessarily realize the richness or the lack of whatever they don't really understand the 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 fullness of the story um but i think that you know this is a journey um and i think that you know the trust factor comes in authenticity um and authenticity comes in different flavors but i i know for me i wake up in the morning um part of my recovery is you know to thine own self be true and making sure that um, I'm, I'm being honest. And, um, so I try and bring that to the table. And I think for right wingers in particular, um, they hear, uh, the stories I tell about being a former libertarian of, of having those beliefs. Um, and I fight with them, <laughs> you know, I fight with them. I fight with myself, you know, I, I'm, I'm in evolution. I'm, I'm constantly, growing and evolving and learning new things and bringing them into the stuff that I produce. Um, I mean, it's people that have watched me over the years, suddenly noticing I'm bringing lots and lots of history that maybe seems unrelated to the MMT project. And maybe it is, but I'm finding ways to tie it together. And, um, and it's been very, very enriching to me personally, um, reading lots of books, books that I never thought I'd read. And I think that's helping me connect with different people that I maybe never would have connected with, you know, in any other way before. Um, so I think I think being open to new experiences helps with producing content that attracts new 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 followers. But um, you know, for me in particular, um, I, I really do think that the right wing is not that far away. I think that being able to talk to those sorts of people. Remember, they want fairness. They're looking for fairness. And what does fairness mean if you understand how the system is used? Um, so I think there's a way of reaching them. I, I was able to be reached. And, and so I, I hold on to that. And I believe uh, you shouldn't throw them away. And I, I think they are a worthwhile group of people, um, you know, to, to, to attempt to reach. And, and you'll, I, I believe the MMT reveals the soul. And I don't believe they're all evil people. So once they learn the truth that they've been lied to, it's amazing some of the things that they bring out as they realize, oh my God, all these new neurons, all these connections in my brain are changing. What does this mean to me? And that's a very destabilizing, almost like vertigo. Um, so I think there's you know, a just transition too for those people that we have to pay attention to in their journey. It's not just hooking them, getting them in the front door. It's not walking away once you brought them in. It's like keeping them going and um, staying relative to what their experience is through your own lived experience. I think that authenticity is huge. Thank you so much for sharing, Steve. Christian, you raise your hand. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, one thing, uh, if there are other questions that come up, we could 
shelved this one. But one thing that I would say I, I, I haven't got the first clue about is building an organization like the Money on the Left Collective have done, but uh, also from much earlier on, Steve did with um, Real Progressives. And I, I, it would really help me to, you know, hear maybe the, the what what the, you know, what they consider to be the salient plot points in the journey from, you know, just some disparate individuals kind of c coming together into something that's that, that you know that's become a coherent whole moving towards a, a goal. I didn't mean that for that to rhyme. It was just uh, just came natural. Uh, Even right. better. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an excellent question. Whoever wants to pick that up. Let me just take a quick crack at this. So I, I'm a project manager by trade and a process manager by trade. And so there's certain things that I do that I do professionally that I saw value, I saw missing in some of the things that I was watching around me. And so the ability to kind of take that knowledge of how do I make inputs and outputs, tools and techniques, how do I build things so that there's actual work to be done and produce a product at the end, you know, that conveyor belt, how do I, how do, I do that? And so for me, that, that kind of brought me to where I didn't want to be a media person. I really didn't. I wanted to develop an organization. Back when I first burst onto the scene in 2015, I could have chosen to be, I could have gone a different route than trying to build an organization. I, I had huge following. We had probably 30 million, before Facebook had messed with the algorithms, had about 30 million people a month literally coming through Real Progressives. And um, we had probably 20, maybe 25 different media personalities on the channel. Um, you know, it was, it was a very different time. It was the height of the Bernie Sanders movement. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, just everybody was pulling for that one goal when Bernie kind of gave up that goal, it became far more challenging because now you were left with people without that, that leader that they were hearkening to, that was kind of the glue for building an organization. Now you had to have something different. And that's when. I started pivoting far more to a direct MMT perspective. And I think that everybody on the team wasn't on board with that shift. Um, and so I've had to learn a lot. There's been various people that have come through the doors um, that, you know, lit a flame and threw the match behind them on the way out. Um, you know, there's been people that have come and gone. There's people that have come back. Um, it's a real challenge, but ultimately at the end of the day, you, you have certain things that you've signed up to do and um, having a, a compass, having a purpose um, is a unifying thing. Having products that have processes in it that people can jump into and involve themselves in and feel like they have a stake in the game. I mean, you know, producing macro and cheese, for example, we've got a, we've got an audio engineer, we've got graphic arts, we've got, transcripts we've got uh, show notes we've got share army we've got you know discussion groups we've got people that run the platforms we've got you know there's so many different angles to running just the media side of it and then the outreach and the writing and the connectivity um it, it it's challenging but if you lay the track work down and people believe in the cause uh the opportunity is there to do some pretty special things um the one thing that's always challenging in the space is that it's got a lot of egos in it and everybody wants to be the king and um, it's better to not have kings, but in a world where everybody wants to be kings, that's always a challenge. So, um, you know, for me, you know, I just keep waking up in the morning. I keep doing what I do and those that want to be a part of it can be a part of it. And those that don't, don't. So that's the best advice I can give. I mean, I've learned more black eyes, gotten more bludgeoning and, uh, one of the hardest things I think is the, uh, the external, uh, propaganda and smear campaigns and other things that can happen to you. How do you respond when that happens? And this is a real challenge for an organization because an organization has goals and, you know, specific things it wants to achieve and accomplish. 
And then you've got outside forces that don't want you to necessarily achieve those things. And so do you put your focus on that? Do you put your focus on trying to build? And I think over the years, uh, you know, I've gotten to the point now where I just don't care that much about it anymore. Now I'm more focused on trying to make the best podcast I can do, um, make sure that we file our taxes when the tax man comes, uh, trying to raise funds, trying to, you know, build processes and procedures to allow other people to really, you know, achieve their goals and aspirations as well. So that's, that's pretty much it, but it's, it's challenge. It's a challenge because unless you can pay people, you're dealing with people purely on a heart and soul kind of basis, blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, it takes a special something to go from blood, sweat, and tears to careers. And uh, we haven't achieved that yet. Trust me. So a lot to learn still. Thanks a lot, Steve. I'll hand it over to Max now. Yeah, I guess I'd like to speak to uh, the money on the left side of this question. And, you know, I think something maybe to add to this mix, too, is the money on the left initially started, right? It was um, it was Scott Ferguson, William Sass and I. And then um, and then very shortly after we brought uh, Will on board um, and we started with a a conference and and a series of uh, and podcasting right and that that's sort of the, the bread and butter of what uh what how it how money on the left began but in addition to that right um you know scott billy and i and 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 now you know the other people in money on the left including will and natty were by by trade you know what we what we do to to pay the bills is is teach right we're teachers in various different contexts right and and that looks different depending on the context but um so i think a part of the way we've thought about building a a collective in a sense is is thinking about how you know diversifying labor um in a in a coordinated way can work as a means of teaching and and you know as as uh, I think most teachers know, right? Teaching is a, a very crucial to it. is is a a performative aspect, right? Uh, a way of of using one's voice and you know whatever perceived authority is associated with whether it's a microphone or a camera or being in front of uh, someone in in a in a room to try and you know communicate something in in one form or another, and we take we take that seriously as uh, uh, an aspect of like probably one of the most important aspects of what media um, do for people in, you know, in the world. And the, the thing I'll add then is a part of structuring organizations with different skill sets. And, you know, someone's got to build the website, as Steve was saying, right. And someone's got to, you know, manage the the upload, someone's got to write the copy, someone's got to produce and edit, someone has to um, do the, the sort of pre-production planning and thinking about um, what we're going to make and what we want to make. And all of that requires a, a kind of internal democratic process. Um, and so that, that's been, I think, where we've spent a lot of our time is, is trying to really think about ways in, 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 in human ways of of mediating those internal democratic processes and and uh, thinking about gr growth and growing organizations in ways that um, also are democratic and and inclusive, right? Um, but also maintain at the same time a certain sort of uh, co collective kind of coherence that is loose, right? That doesn't have to be rigid. Um, so I think that's perhaps the main process point that th this sort of collective teaching project. Um, and creative one, uh, it, it sort of hinges upon our kind of democratic com communication kind of ethos that we have within the organization. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks a lot, Max. Um, and I'll hand over to Natty uh, quickly, and then we'll try to get to some of the audience questions. Yeah, I just wanted to say I was thinking along with Max that, I mean, the teaching is part of the activism. And it's interesting that a lot of times I see like in the chat, people are worried about what's online activism that's slacking versus real life. And then this sort of disavowal of like online while people are describing online activities is always interesting. Like, oh, we need to do real things by writing, by 
um, connecting or we have old memes from the 90s that are analog and that was more real. The thing is you're always in language, you're always in communication and it's important to, you don't know where people are coming from a lot of times. Like you don't know what protests people have been at, you don't know what meetings people have been at, you don't know what militancy is in people's experience and it's important to not fixate on absolute boundaries between things like online reality because those are together and always working together and aren't even two. It's it's all woven really complicatedly. And I think we have to be vigilant, not to project paranoia about our own inability to complete every problem in the world alone onto our own individual failures and see that in other people's failures, right? No, like you don't know where people are coming from. You don't know what they've done and what people want to do. And I think the key is to be encouraging and your fealty is to different people. People have different reasons to protect themselves. Like there's different people who it's not, have to make strategic choices about how vulnerable they want to be to right-wing um, discourses. And it's fine to have different people at different moments, but I think people repress the extent to which communication and teaching is part of this other real world analogical um, organizing space that has always been, you know, you go to a protest and people are videoing, of course, like you're not just like ripping parts of yourself off each other. It's, it's more complicated than that. And I think we sometimes we're frustrated about it's hard to change things and we sort of put our own sense of failure onto other people. And I think it's important to be vigilant about caring for each other and encouraging each other in terms of like where we want to go. Uh, Thanks a lot, uh, Natty, and everyone who answered that question. Hopefully that addressed what uh, you were getting at, Christian. Um, now, I, I see a couple other people raising their hands, um, but we're going to go to the audience Q&A now so that they get a chance. And uh, I'll try to throw it to um, one of you folks that raised your hands if I get a chance. So um, the first two questions here are, are kind of both for superstructure and money the left type people. Um, the first one, it, I. I feel like this is a bit of a meme. Uh, how does one make uh, superstructure uh, content more accessible? Um, but the one that is uh, sort of a bit deeper is that uh, what do you see money on the left doing that advances intersectional practice specifically? And in crafting your content, do you prioritize a wide reach or a more specific group and why is that? So that ties a little bit back to some questions earlier, but if you want to take a shot at that, go ahead. I'll just say quickly that I'm like a huge nerdy reader and I love to follow a lot of stuff. And I actually met Money on the Left through Will and Max's podcast when Will was doing like his parodic character. And that was like, I clicked on that, you know, like neoclassical Marxism, like that parodic kind of approach of looking at something I was familiar with, which has international stakes, right? Like when Doug Henwood writes against MMT and Jacobin, you know, he's writing about how inflation his right-wing version of how inflation happened under Allende, right? Like there's, that's part of the stakes of things, right? And so when I see a parodic, like that's one point of access, I'm like, oh, what's this funny thing about like making fun of this? And so for me, it's like, that's how I met these people. And so I'm optimistic about the different ways people want to engage and that you give people ass and access points. They're different and come out of your networks in different ways. And you're always trying to move those because that's what being alive and conscientious is and like I'm optimistic about the ways we want to reach different people. Thanks a lot. Um, if uh, if there's nothing else. Um... Yeah, um, well, I can I can say uh, speaking, I guess, both to the intersectionality point, I think, and the kind of accessibility point, there's this kind of question of accessible to who, right? And I think that often when the question is asked, there's this kind of imagination of a sort of common denominator, normal person, right? Who who knows, you know, the kind of boilerplate stuff that everybody knows, and that's the majority of people. And so you need to meet the normal people first. And sometimes it's, it's, described as almost in the language of like a trade-off, right? Like you can't be too weird or you can't be too X, Y, or Z or else you will, you know, not get a big audience. Um, and I think that, I, I think that having a really big audience is, is a specific form. Um, I think that that's, 
and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's really important. Um, but I don't think that, you know, getting everybody in the world onto one, one big podcast is necessarily uh, the only, um, the only way forward. And I, I think that what we do is very attentive uh, to the ways that these zero sum logics uh, kind of map onto and construct uh, identities and especially marginal identities, you know, um, conversations uh, like especially right wing discourse now that's all about families and, you know, nuclear families and kind of villainizing LGBT people as groomers and, and this kind of thing like that doesn't just come out of the sky, you know, like that's that's actually fiscally constructed. There has to be planning for there to be suburbs um, and for nuclear families and, you know, identities to be a particular way. Um, and that construction ends up excluding a lot of people and kind of shoring up the idea of an other in the first place. Um, and so one, one of the things I guess I'll just say is that Money on the Left has a lot of different you know, offerings, I guess, right? Like superstructure is, is a very specific thing. Money on the left is a lot more ecumenical and it's a lot more, um, you know, reaching a lot of different, uh, you know, it's, it's as close as you can get to the kind of common denominator, quote unquote, without actually necessarily being a common denominator either, because, you know, money on the left has academics. And, you know, I think that the reason why we're a collective and not just one podcast is because even though all of these projects are very different and they're very different both in scale, in audience, in scope, um, they nevertheless all sort of rhyme with each other, I think. And I think that that kind of rhyming is going to, um, in the long run, if you can build up an, an infrastructure of people who've kind of felt their way through something that feels intuitively like something that they can understand and play with, that can actually be something that can be scaled up in different ways than tr necessarily than trying to route everybody through the business card story, right? Or, you know, um, and any of the original kind of MMT, uh, you know, 101 things, which are also really great as stories. Um, but I, I guess... I, and not to read too much into the question, I guess, but um, I, I think that there's no necessary reason why all media projects have to be uh, a certain way um, or why they necessarily preclude other media projects from being other ways or crowd out other media projects. And, you know, I mean, I think that when we started, uh, I think that we, especially with Superstructure, had something that we wanted to say that I think we felt like was going to be hard to understand um, at first. And I think that we felt like, and this was kind of a, an emotional choice, I guess, and like a, self, a, a kind of self-discipline, although I really hate that framing, um, but there was a, a sense that, well, if we start this now, then in a couple of years, we'll have been thinking out loud about all of this stuff with other people, building capacity around these things, and we'll already be in mid-stride and thinking of something else rather than trying to wait until we understood the one way to explain it perfectly to everybody and then share it and spread it. Um, and it's it's not that that those kinds of approaches are bad either. We just think that they're that they're complementary. Um, because everything's always an ecosystem. So, thank you so much, Will and Natty as well for answering that. All right. So the next question is uh, generally for someone that, who has had um, who understands MMT fairly well, but who has had not much luck convincing people that it's great value. What strategy or variety of strategies do you all recommend? And what specific points have you found to be more or most effective in persuading people? Whoever wants to take that can go ahead. I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, I, I was wrestling with that very question. Uh, and what I did was then go, well, who else feels the same way? It's very easy to do online. And that's how I met Patricia. And I, outside of that happened to be a person that loved audio podcasts um so um i was looking for something that you know along these lines and there wasn't anything uh, uh you know apart from steve who was doing his fantastic um uh real progressive uh, teaching videos 
uh and um i guess i'll just confess now you know i would make audio out of his videos for my own personal use sorry steve <laughs> and um uh and um uh, i just find it a, 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 an easier way to learn for me personally so again that was just me going you know again selfishly going okay what would i like <laughs> and uh, but anyway that that was my my the problem that I was trying to solve was, yeah, I can't just sidle up to people in in my social life and go, hey, you know, taxes don't fund spending and have an, <laughs> end up having a great conversation. Um, uh, uh, you know, and it's a problem that I think affects all of us, uh, you know, and, and we kind of think, oh, we do. by rights, this is such a fantastic, blindingly obvious insight that changes everything life and death stuff i should be able to just say one thing in a social situation which will you know which which will just align everybody and i think the moment you let go of that idea and start thinking okay i just treat different people differently and 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 uh, you know that which is another great thing about the internet and i just wanted to also while i remember this idea, I, I saw, I, I, I couldn't quite follow it word for word in the chat, but people talking about oh, it is online activism, real activism and all of it. And I just think everybody here has heard about MMT. Some people are understand it very, very well. And it's like, where did you hear that from? You know, did you walk into a Bill Mitchell lecture? <laughs> Did, did you were you working in a bank and warren mosler chatted to you of course you were you heard about it on the internet we all heard about it on the internet so you know let's let's it's you know it has serious consequences you know we, we can we can affect change like this you know uh so yeah anyway um uh, yeah so my first advice is, you know, find people who are already interested in what you're interested in. I think when you want to, you know, uh, spread MMT, you know, just take the the path of, of least resistance. And there's a lot of people out there now, you know, um, uh, and, and there's going to be more, you know, like this whole thing that's going on with Russia demanding payment in rubles. And what does that mean? People get curious about the mechanics of money because of all this stuff. And, and, you know, they're, they're out there, you know? So yeah, I would start there anyway. That's me. Thanks so much, Christian. Uh, we'll go Patricia, then Steve, and then Jessica. Yeah. So, um, I agree with everything Christian has said, but um, I think I've been thinking about this recently. And, I, and I, the first thing I want to say is that there, there's no one kind of formula that works for everybody. And I think everybody here will agree with that. Um, but if I want to generalize, I would say that the most important thing to do is to actually listen first. Um, and what I, what I mean with that is that if if you frame your message in a way that appeals to the audience's values or appeals to a certain way that they're accustomed to thinking. For example, like obviously I surround myself with engineers every day and they think in a very particular way. So I know sort of I've learned what what um, works with them, but that's only come through, you know, years of failing and trying again and actually listening to um, the things that they cared about and how then to frame our arguments in, in ways that resonated with them. So um, uh, appealing to people's values, I think, is incredibly important. But also um, something that I've also grown to kind of understand is that um, MMT has an enormous power to um, uh, free people from very restrictive ways of thinking. And uh, this kind of um, pay for kind of mentality it frames a lot of what people believe to be possible in the economy and therefore um, uh, what kind of injustices they tolerate as a result of that. Um, um, and so sometimes e even just opening people's minds to the reality of MMT, naturally, I think I I've started to have faith that people will get to those kind of views, more, more progressive views, more em empathetic views of the economy by themselves without me having to say, oh, you can only do this, you know, in a good way. And so I, I think sometimes that means just having faith that people will get there on their own accord, um, and uh, which is not always easy, but it's something that I've learned recently, so I wanted to share. Thank you so much. I'll hand it to Steve, and then after we'll go to Jessica. You know, uh, you know one of the things that 
Jessica does, and I'm sure she'll tell you about it here in a second, but she's got the medium, the TikTok medium. And then TikTok, it's basically a bumper sticker. I mean, you've got a very, very short window to make a very poignant point. And, and you see people flock to it for, for a variety of reasons, right? But you see other groups out there that have huge audiences. And you're like, how the hell did these guys get this huge audience? And you start studying. You try to figure out what is it that's drawing them to that. And you start to realize there's these like affinity groups, if you will. Um, but most people genuinely do not. And if they wanted to, they would have gone to school and done it. You know, what I mean, most people that I'm running into, they they're interested in like the standard yell at the TV. I don't like you, politician A. I don't like you, politician B. And they've got the Fox News angle coming at them and they've got the CNN MSNBC angle coming at them. And this makes up their entire. Politic, that's that's what they know. They go to work. They have the water cooler. They talk to whoever. The pandemic changed things. People had to focus on some social media. And so you got to experience a different kind of feel. Unfortunately, we also dealt with algorithms, a lot of censorship, an incredible amount of authoritarian behavior with the tech companies and uh, in cahoots in some ways with our, our government. Um, but ultimately, what I found is, is that people genuinely give you about maybe 10 seconds, maybe 10 seconds. And you can see that in the algorithms. You can see that in the YouTube uh, reports, how long people stick around and when the, when the audience fades or when they come back or when they really stay, they give you little nice uh, readings, graphical readings of retention and things like that. And I, I really genuinely believe you, you, Christian nailed it uh, in his earlier remarks where he said, if you don't get them in that first 30 seconds, they may not listen to your podcast at all. So unfortunately, a lot of the discussions about MMT, you know, people want to give you the long version of it. I want to give you the long version of it a lot of times. I mean, I, it's it's hard not to because it's a, it's a rich story. There's a lot to say. There's a lot of interesting thoughts to have. Uh, a lot of great angles to think about and awakenings of your own mind, but to actually present things to people, you know, I, I look at like Alcoholics Anonymous and I look at, you know, uh, evangelism in general. And it's, it's kind of like, you got to hook them with something that you, there's a saying, nobody really wants to know what you know until they know how much you care. And that goes back to that authenticity. But it's really that initial shock. And so we did come out there with taxes, don't fund spending. And we had varied responses. Either A, people were screaming and yelling at us, you're crazy, you're libertarians, you're friggin' nuts. You know, or or they came back and they said, oh, you must be these Republicans that just don't want these things. And, and, and you just kind of shocked. You just sit back and listen to how they respond back to that. But the fact is, is that they cared. You got them. Whether you like the statement taxes don't fund spending or not, you caught their attention. It's like, what did that guy say? Is he an idiot? Have you ever opened a textbook? Have, what's your credentials? You know, it brings out some visceral reaction. And now you got a chance to have a conversation because unlike, you know, a lot of people, well, maybe like a lot of people, I, I don't get to get out of the bat cave very often. You know, I've got children. The pandemic has really disciplined me to the ball and chain of the home. Um, so really, you know, what used to be a very, very vibrant, I could travel, go to all these actions, be a part of speaking rallies. It's largely been reduced. And, and I don't know if it's reduced, but it's changed form to doing panels and doing live streams and doing podcasts and stuff like that. So I think it's really critical to have that hook. And even if it's bombastic or even if it's just confusing, what the hell did he just say? I think that that right there, that moment that makes them even care to ask what the heck you were talking about, that is a really key factor. And once you hook them with that, then you've got an opportunity to do all the the, the splaining. Um, but I do think it takes a second because you're, you're there's so much internet noise. There's so much clickbait. There's so much just trash and trivia and, and like lots and lots of 
you know, just op-edding and, and things like that, that you have to fight through. And they like James Bond, James Bond rocks. They want to, they want to feel the spiciness of, you know, they want to be entertained. And so getting past that, you know, that wall, um, it, it's tough. So I think it's critical to have a hook to get out through there and to get your chance, you know, your little pamphlet, your little entry line, your, your one-off, uh, the icebreaker that gets you in the in the game. I think that's critical to even having any of the larger conversations. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, we're getting close to the end. Uh, we'll go a little bit over just to kind of wrap up. Um, we'll go to Jessica next. And there was another question that was specifically for you that kind of tied in a little bit that was about uh, people on TikTok. Do you see a difference in like generational awareness of economics and willingness to accept alternative paradigms and then uh, after you we'll give jeff the final word then go around get everyone the chance to shout them out shout themselves out and uh call it a panel yeah that's a good question i'm gonna start with the the one we were just grappling with um how do we win people on mmt i'm gonna talk about manifesting i think it's this sounds crazy and it's funny but it's important I think as creators, like people who create content, I watch Tucker Carlson a lot. He is telling people what the world is. He's not giving his analysis on the world. He's not saying within the context of how the world actually is, these are my thoughts. He's telling people what the world is. And I think we just need to do more of that. Like, of course, MMT is the answer, is the, the correct framework for, for looking at, you know, the monetary system and you know, a prescription for how we should make monetary policy, like, of course, and it's ridiculous when people say that adding more money into the economy causes inflation. It's not that simple. And to really project that kind of confidence, because we are confident in this worldview, and we know that many people don't accept it. But as soon as people catch like a sense of, of lack of confidence, or that the story you're telling about the world is not one you're sure of, I think we lose people. And I think there's just a lot of power in that when it comes to storytelling and creating content. And it really works like on an organizing level as well. Like when I worked on the Bernie campaign, we created events out of nothing. And we would just call volunteers and say like, hey, we're having a big you know, Labor Day cookout. Everyone who supports Bernie in the area is gonna be there. Like, here's the time, like, what time are you coming? What are you bringing? And really just speaking the world we wanna live in into existence. I think there's a lot of power in that. Um, and then I will say the, the question about TikTok is I get such a range of different people. Um, of course, TikTok leans young. And there, there is this rumor that like younger people, you know, are more progressive. I think that's true. But also I've seen a lot of older people who have like reached out directly and have said like, you know, I'm, you know, in the late stage of my career, but I'm thinking about like going back and getting, you know, a master's degree in economics or something like like this thing of MMT has completely like reshaped my worldview and is changing my life. And so it's a, it's a decent mix. And like my TikTok audience actually leans older compared to what's typical. And so it's interesting. Uh, I think everyone's gettable. I don't think it's like just the youths on TikTok. A lot of people are on TikTok. It's like the most popular online destination in the world now. Thanks a lot. And uh, Jeff, we'll give you the final word and then we'll go around and briefly let everyone shout themselves out. Uh, so kind of touching on some stuff that's been coming up now, there's a question from Brant in the chat. And his question is, what media is missing that you'd like to see? And he gives an example of billboards. Um, so in the 2016 Bernie campaign, there was a four minute uh, campaign video documentary that starred Erica Garner called It's Not Over where at the end of it, she gives Bernie this high compliment, calling him, he's a protester. And it's so moving, it's such a moving, it's just a wonderful video. And then in 2020 campaign, there was a, a two minute fan made video uh, that was turned into a campaign commercial where Killer Mike was giving a speech that was quoting and evoking James Baldwin called The Time Is Now. And again, Another one that is just profoundly moving. Both of these videos I've probably seen like 50 times and I still get choked up at both of them. They're just wonderful. And the reason I say this is because I don't think it's necessarily a question of what media do we wanna create because I think we have great stuff already out there. Not to say that we can't do more and that we can't 
you know, do it for different audiences and do it better and whatever. But we have great stuff already out there. So the question is not just what can we do to create more good stuff? The question is, how do we get what we already have out there? And that is really a question of the reality of the people who would have to downgrade to platinum covered pools down to gold plated pools are the ones that are in charge of that are in front of the levers of power and in front of the levers of media and social media. Elon Musk just became the primary shareholder of uh, of Twitter, which is the center of the MMT universe on the Internet. Um, so it's. You know, the, the only reason people saw these Bernie videos is because I shoved it in their faces in my iPad, the IHOP waitress. I showed her the video on my iPad and I was at my, uh, 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 what was it, my physical therapy and I put the iPad up to the person checking me out. That's the only reason these people saw these amazing videos because no one's going to show them because Bernie might get elected if they did. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of, you know, Jessica was kind of touching on of how can we get that stuff out there. And I think this is kind of a reflection of the move of the movement and the theory as a whole. We have the winning argument, obviously, that can save the world without exaggeration. And it's just a matter of people choosing to, you know, understand it. But we struggle to get that out there. So I don't I don't think it's a matter of can how do we come up with a better theory? I think it's a matter of we just have to we have to hit the problem from all angles because we don't know which one is going to break first and we have to be ready. And part of that is getting is talking to people. And part of that is trying to get people out of power. Um, I don't know. I'll just leave it there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Those are pretty uh, good closing words. Um, we'll now just go briefly around to allow everyone to uh, shut themselves out, let us know where we can find your content, and um, if there's anything like upcoming soon, but just very briefly, um, go to the NMT podcast first. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I wish somebody else would go first. <laughs> I don't know what a shout out is. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, our, our thing is called the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. I think Patricia Pino is an easier name to remember. So if you put the MMT podcast Patricia Pino into your search engine, um, then uh, you will find our podcast. And uh, that's that's really it. Uh, I'm on Twitter at MMT podcast. And Patricia is on Twitter. At, <laughs> I'm going to speak for you, Patricia. This, this is terrible. Yes, uh, at, 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 at Patricia N. Pino. End for November. Patricia. We also have a, a website which is slowly being populated with with all our past episodes. So bear with us on that. But uh, you can also go to that, and it's the dmmtpodcast dot com. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, Jeff, where can we find you? Um, I'm an activist MMT on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, my website where just a lot of written uh, resources for regular people, but guiding them to the works of the academics is activistmmt.org. Um, that's where. Awesome. Jessica, where can we find you? I'm on TikTok. Uh, it's cover bank. I'll put it in the chat. Also, Rebel HQ's YouTube channel with the Young Turks. And I'll post on Twitter when I'm going on the main channel as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Money on the Left, Superstructure folk, where can we find you? Yeah, so uh, moneyonthelef.org is our website, and we have just a whole lot of stuff there. Um, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at a going account. It's too late for me to change my name, so that's what it is. I'm sorry, everyone. It should be Will Beeman, but, uh, you know, you live and you learn. Um, and, yeah, I'll let everyone else say their, their handles. Yeah, so I mean, just on Twitter at Max Seho, um, I'll add, you can subscribe to our podcast feed. There's one feed, Money on the Left, and all the different shows will pop in there. Um, follow Money on the Left on Twitter um, as well. We make sure to post everything. We also have an account for Superstructure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'll be under the money on the left feed as well. I'm doing Superstructure. I'm doing Medium Femme. My uh, name is an old one from college, but it's uh, Orange, Orange, Orange Jasm, uh, which I think is part of our ongoing uh, activism of, of pleasure as part of the ongoingness of political process and our rejection of sovereign patriarch 
hearts as driving all ideas and victories and um, processes. So. Thank you so much. And Steve, where can we find you and your work? So uh, you can find our website at uh, realprogressives.org. Uh, to find all of our content, go to the media drop down and you'll find Macro and Cheese, but you can find Macro and Cheese on any podcast hosting platform. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Austerity is Murder or just SD Grumbine. I kept it simple. Um, the uh, organization's Twitter feed is Real Progress US, and that was a very unfortunate <laughs> name. Um, and uh, you can also find me now um, at Status Coup on Tuesday nights with Jordan. Uh, he and I do a show together. And then on Thursday nights, I uh, do the uh, uh, Let's Get Ready to Grumble. It's usually a three-ring fight, three-round fight, three subjects, usually tie them together, usually have an MMT analysis as part of it. Um, and please do check us out. All right, and I would like to thank everybody for attending the kickoff event of the fourth annual Modern Money Network Conference. Um, it was my pleasure to host this panel with all of you fine people. Uh, for anybody interested in more MMN content, there is another event tomorrow, uh, just called What is MMN, um, hosted by Hannah, and that is going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can find that on our site, on our Twitter, um, at the MMT Network. You can find me, myself, on Twitter at Van Monza, V-A-N-M-O-N-S-A. Once again, thank you to everybody for attending and uh, look forward to seeing all your work as it develops in the near future. Take care. <laughs>